we did our, our interview a couple of months ago now, um, you, st you said the phrase, uh, you called AI a polymath. Yep. And I used, I was like instantly grabbed it. I was like, that's a good headline. So I used it for the headline. Um, and then I used it for the title of this talk today. Um, what do you mean when you, when you refer to AI as a polymath? And what are like the unique facets of that? We know what the word means, but like applying it to AI, I think is, is really insightful. Yeah, as you know, I mean, human polymaths are people that have a very broad understanding, perhaps in multiple domains, or in, specifically in multiple domains. And they have an ability to integrate that because it's all in their head. As we train these bigger and bigger AIs, uh, they are being trained on essentially all the world's information. So to some extent, they're the ultimate polymath. Uh, I think importantly, one of their greatest contributions, and one we haven't talked that much about here yet, is that the ability for the machine to, to reason across this incredible array of things that it understands. And unlike a human who has a tough time sweating the details, you know, you, you might remember quite a bit about a lot of things, but it's hard to go deep on everything. These machines kind of have both. They have breadth and depth. And so as they become more and more potent reasoning engines, uh, their ability to solve problems that humans can't solve, I think, will distinguish their contributions. And we're growing into that phase now. It's uh, difficult for people to step far enough back and think about how to organize a problem-solving activity around this polymathic capability. But I think the more they do that, the more they'll be pleasantly surprised with the results that they get. So I think one of the ways large language models have been explained is that they're predictive engines. They're taking large sets of language and they're just anticipating what the next word should be and then creating that. And, and, and that's how they, they generate these results. It seems like what you're talking about is something like more, gen, like, more like genuine reasoning. Well, I think it, it's true that, that while these machines have been built using algorithms that are sort of based on prediction, my, my sort of you know, curt answer to people who say hey, these things only predict the next word is, well, if that's all they do, then that's all you do, all right? Uh, and in fact, you know, a lot about the human brain is all about prediction. You know, our brains aren't fast enough to allow you to do things like walk down the stairs if you were trying to operate this as a closed loop control system. So your body learns how to predict what it has to do to go down the next step. So is that just a, does it reason or doesn't it reason? Mm -hmm. I think most of the people that are close to these things now, you know, undeniably think that these things are already doing reasoning. And the reasoning and the stepwise progression through problems it will be the next phase. Uh, today, you tend to give it one question in one context, and it kind of gets you one answer. Um, and there's some reasoning that goes on in there. But this chain of thought type of reasoning will emerge, you know, I think in the next uh, short time. And then the potency of this will be even greater. I think one of the things that's happened in the last couple of weeks, as OpenAI has announced um, this sort of AI app store of multiple chat GPTs. Um, I think we've moved from the age of like people think of one large language model, one chat GPT. Now there's going to be a whole array of them with different skills and, and different abilities. Can you just talk a little bit about how that's transformative? Yeah, I, I think it's important to to realize that the app store is not going to have, you know, a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million copies of the, the base foundation model. So these GPTs that you're creating are really just, you know, things that are added to the base model. I think that's also an important thing to realize is uh, it, it's sort of the, the big difference between machine learning, which in many cases has been rebranded AI over the last decade or so because it was sexier, mm. uh, but the true AI capabilities are only now emerging. And, and in that environment, uh, the ability to, to teach these things that are already very smart, it, it, it becomes a lot easier. So why can OpenAI now <clears throat> tell you, bring your own data, build your own capability by adding it to this thing, mm. and then these little plugins, if you will, are something that are going to be saleable in an app store. To me, this is sort of uh, an example of what we see, have seen in the computing industry over the last 40 years happen over and over again. That you take a concept and you offer it to people and you, you realize that it really had two parts. It had a platform part and an application part. And all platforms initially get established by some killer app that people just love. They take it up really quickly 
it causes diffusion. When, it's, when the platform's out there, it creates an opportunity for other people to say, build on top of it. And so if you look back to the history of the personal computer, uh, the phone, and now many of the big web services, they all started with something that everybody w wanted to do, make phone calls or send text messages, uh, crew, you know, browse the internet, do email. And if, I, if you think about the, when the iPhone was launched, it only had four apps built in. There, weren't, there was no app store or anything else. Mm -hmm. And once the phone gets more and more distributed, just like the PC, then all the de developers come along. I think we're at that moment now uh, with this launch by OpenAI a week ago of this new capability to add your own agent to some extent. Mm. I think this agent concept is really going to be super important. And it, it'll be the, the way that these machines are packaged and enhanced just like you keep adding things to your phone to do more of the things you want to do. And so I think, in a sense, ChatGPT, now one year in, was the killer app of AI. Mm -hmm. And you could see that with the fastest adoption in history of anything. And now that that's out there, you, you've got a developer community that's building around it, and you're going to see an incredible array of things built on top of it. And a lot of these previous technological uh, inflection points there's a flurry of innovation. There's a, a lot of players in the market. And then over time, you know, forces consolidate and you wind up with a few leaders in social media, a few leaders in the platforms. Do you think that we're going to see that same pattern happen in the AI industry or is, is it going to be more distributed? I, I think that in terms of the really potent things, you're going to see a consolidation, but still only a handful. And part of the reason is despite the progress, um, it's still really expensive to put these things together and train them. I don't see that that, that cost is going to collapse dramatically in the next five to ten years. And, and, and over that horizon, we can see almost an unlimited ability to keep making these brains bigger and smarter. Uh, and so, and I, I think there will be lots of little models, and people will try to do them. I think people haven't quite realized yet that if you if you take a little model that it's just not that smart, so to speak, mm -hmm. and you decide you want to teach it something new, it's a bit like starting with a, a young kid and saying, all right, I want to teach you calculus. You know, and you say, well, gee, but you know, I don't have that much basis to learn calculus, so you better show me a lot of things to let me figure this out. And that's what's been going on for decades in the machine learning space, is that you're training over and over very narrow little models uh, and it takes a huge amount of data, often labeled data, for it to understand what's signal and what's noise and then figure out what it is you want it to repeat. When you start with these big models now, it's like starting with somebody who's got a postdoc in several disciplines, and you say, okay, now I want to teach you something at the margin. This person is really smart, has a lot of background, and the amount of stuff you have to give them to get to the next level is much, much smaller. So I think as people both try to tackle bigger problems, they may find that it's a lot easier to get a small amount of high quality data and add it to a big model at the margin than it is to take and find a lot more data that's perhaps super clean and well labeled in order to facilitate training up littler models. And I think this is one of the big tensions now between people who say, hey, but it's going to be cheap and I'll do this. Um, but that also ignores where we started in the conversation, which is the polymathic nature of these things. If their ultimate real significant contribution comes from this polymathic capability, you, you, everybody's not going to be able to retrain their own polymath and then have it do something. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there'll be a spectrum, but I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised to find how potent the solutions can be when you start always adding them at the margin on top of a very powerful machine. One of the things we've talked around a lot over the last couple of days is, is the issue of alignment. Um, and I don't think we've used the word enough. Um, we've talked about the promise and the peril and, and, and the risks involved in, uh, potential risks involved in AI. But maybe talk a little bit about how you see the alignment of AI going forward and how we can develop these things in an ethical and safe way. Yeah, I mean, right now I think uh, I put people sort of in three buckets. You know, there's the people who look at this stuff and have been, you know, encouraged to be frightened by it, uh, but are not very close to what's actually going on. And so I describe that as the group that admires the problem, but doesn't actually know what to do about it. 
there's a lot of people involved in the industry who are very concerned about these things. They've articulated that they have concern. And from my vantage point, happily, they're actually doing things about it. Uh, you know, if you look at some, some of the, I'll say the strategic differences, for example, between what the DeepMind people and the OpenAI people started with, you know, I think the DeepMind folks had more of a strategy. It says, as we get this thing and it's going to get smarter and smarter, when it looks like it's getting smart enough to ha have a problem, then we'll have some people go work on trying to make sure it doesn't have a problem. But we won't give it to anybody until that is done. The OpenAI Microsoft people, on the other hand, took a different approach, which said there's really, at the beginning, two problems. One problem is we don't know what the humans are going to do when they approach this thing. And so the, the idea that we could anticipate everything is poor. Uh, reciprocally, we don't, we think that the society is going to have to adapt to the idea that perhaps machines that are equal or ultimately greater than humans in their intellectual capability are going to arrive. That's never happened in history. It's a fundamental, very profound change. And, and the idea that, that the society needed to get exposure to this, I think, was the second part of that. The third part is, I think of as the yet to come part. And it also comes back to this polymathic nature of the machine. Because the polymathic machine will be able to solve problems that humans can neither anticipate or perhaps even understand once the solution is provided, you have a new problem, all right, as it relates to safety and alignment, which is you can't anticipate it. Uh, it it's like completely something out, out of the range of your thought. And therefore, the idea that you could write rules for it ahead of time doesn't work. And if it's sort of categorically in a different bucket than anything we've ever seen before, then even things that, that kind of go at this in some broader constitutional, you know, where, where constitution is still writing down, you know, some principles on which you're going to try to govern or control. And so, uh, personally, I've spent a lot of time in the last three years focused on exactly this question, which is, how do you bring together all of these varied interests, which is the companies themselves, the user community, society, civil society writ large, governments, academia. You know, you have all of these communities, and in the end, they're all going to have to cooperate in order to get an answer to this. And part of the reason for that is that it's got to be a global answer. And right now, you hear di different governments talking about this, but you, know, you don't see any particular direction. Personally, the way I think that this will be ultimately done is that the AI has to be trained to control itself. Just like you raise your kids and you try to give them good values and, and mores and and, and, you, and rules, and they understand growing up more and more about the rules, you do that in hopes that when they go out into society and do stuff, you know, or encounter new things, that they'll do the right thing. I think ultimately that, that we have to think of the AIs the same way. The idea that, that we're going to be able, as humans, to write rules for them, particularly if you, if you really think that some of these threats could be existential. The classic concept of legislation depends on the idea that says, when I see a bad thing, I'll legislate against it and create deterrent from having it happen again. But it's, if it's existential, if it happens once, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is we have to even be more hardcore about trying to prevent bad things from happening at any scale. And, and when I think of existential risks, many people seem to want to focus on, you know, is, it's, is it the species that gets exterminated? Um, I, I think existential risks can be individual too. You know, if you take these machines and you, you know, expose a vulnerable, sort of emotionally vulnerable teenager to them, uh, it's definitely clear that the machine can talk them into a bad space. Mm -hmm. And if, if that, you know, produces, you know, a, you know a, a bad thing for that teenager, that could be, you know, no way home. And so I think that the machines have to be able to supervise themselves in any given context and in any class of problems. And, and so I think the next phase of this will be to take what we've learned by guardrails and constitutional techniques and other things and really start to think, how do we gather this 
information together in a more global, participatory way. I think many of the leading companies are starting to talk about that and find that. Just recently, a few days ago, OpenAI announced a new program to, to basically have open data collection about you know, the things that relate to safety and governance. If you look at uh, the Anthropic work, you know, they created the constitutional idea and built that into their system. Uh, but they, they wrote the Constitution. So people, some people are uncomfortable saying, well, you know, I don't want to just have that Constitution. You know, I want to my Constitution. Yeah. And so how that's all going to come to be uh, is, is unclear. But, but I see all the major players starting to move in a direction where there's going to be more participation in creating the training materials by which you can ground these machines. The reason I'm hopeful that that can be done is there's already a clear requirement and effort in other areas to introduce ground truth information. And the most obvious is in the areas of you know, math, physics, science, biology. Uh, somebody mentioned it yesterday uh, that well, the machine can't ignore the laws of physics. But when everything has been introduced to the machine and represented only in probabilistic terms, then that's where you get this hallucinatory behavior or where, in fact, the machine doesn't know what's absolute truth from what's like high probability truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's being remediated in the technical work that's going on now. And so if we can introduce ground truth information for science, then I personally believe that we'll be able to build on that capability to introduce ground truth information for values, mores, and laws, and thereby have the machine not break those rules just like they don't break or won't break the, the laws of nature. And I think through that step, we'll be able to create machines that as the polymathic nature continues to grow, so will their own ability to adjudicate usage. And I think that's the only ultimate solution. Uh, I know you're very involved in, in areas of medical research and you think there's some extraordinary potential here. Maybe talk a little bit about that and, and what is getting you excited. Well, the thing that gets me excited is you know, human, you know, scientific endeavor and medical biology studies, you know, we now know more about humans at a molecular level than we've ever known before. But the more we know, the more we realize how incredibly complicated human biology is. And so whether you just care about wellness and prevention or cure, uh, or ultimately, you know, trying to improve uh, the human lot in life, uh, I've concluded that human biology is too complicated for humans, but not for the machines. And so if, if we really aspire to doing a, a lot of these new things, more or less at a cellular and, and, and uh, molecular level, we need a polymathic machine that can actually suss out all the details of human biology and help guide us to the changes we want to make. And whether those changes are, in the short term, the ability to just deal better with health and wellness, you know, uh, I think yesterday somebody was talking about, you know, wh what if we go to space, you know, and we want to become a space-faring uh, thing. I think that the downstream issues that, that the society is going to have to deal with is, you know, I personally think that, that evolution of humans is over. Going forward, it's all going to be design. And, and these machines will help humans design what changes they want to make. And so while people have been concerned historically about what that implies from an ethical point of view, uh, I think it's inevitable that as we decide we're going to send people to live in space, you know, we didn't evolve in space. We're not super well engineered to be there, uh, but we could probably fix that if we want. And so the question is, you know, how, how does broadly the human society decide to handle these questions? But I think we're going to have a set of tools that will allow us to do those things, just like we've mastered tools that allow us to deal with all the physical things in our world. I think the, 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 the amazing thing about the, the medical developments is that you're going to have this, the ability to understand the human biology on a, on a macro level, but then you're going to be able to inform it with all of your personal information and have that personalized medicine experience based on your own genetics and, and uh, epigenetics. And, and Yeah, the, the really tricky thing is ultimately we're all individuals, and, but today we don't have a way of doing N of one medicine. I think that will come now through this you know, the ability to, to, to use these machines to, to understand that and ultimately to prove it. You know, the way we get comfort, safety in, in medicine today, and we talked about this a little yesterday, is we have the FDA. 
But what does the FDA do? We do statistical studies on more and more humans to try to figure out whether the risk reward ratio looks good and then we'll give it to everybody else. Well, if it's N of one, you can't do that. Therefore, you need to be able to decide safety and efficacy in, in quantity one solutions and then manufacture that for the individual. Again, I think with these machines, that'll be doable. Uh, but it requires a complete rethink. I mean, biology and, and human uh, biology is, is an incredibly complicated thing. It's really one of the few areas where we haven't created both a design mechanism tool chain and a simulation tool chain. I mean, whether you build buildings, rockets, airplanes, you know, whatever it is, we design them and we test them uh, before we ever build them or fly them. And we need to be able to do that for humans, too. We need to be able to know that, you know, if you have a disease, whether genetic in nature or, you know, came from some other cause, if you want to intervene and fix it, you want to do it at a root cause level. That's what we currently don't do in biology. You know, we're treating symptoms, uh, but we don't have safe ways to treat at the root cause because we don't understand it. And I think that this will perhaps be one of the greatest contributions of, of, of AGI as it, as it arrives. Wonderful. Craig, thanks so much for coming in. It was great thanks having you here for the last couple of days. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.